Hi, my name is Sharon Chen. I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician. So in this video, I'm going to discuss with you important concepts about virology so that you can link the biology of viruses to your patient. This will allow you to better understand how the patient's disease started and progressed. This overview about virology and viruses is filled with concepts that we specifically chose for its relevance to clinical medicine. This video on the viral structure, evolution, and classification is part of our series on introduction to microbiology. The learning objectives are to identify the distinctive structures of a virus and describe their function, to describe a generalized viral life cycle, and to distinguish the different ways of cataloging viruses. So you might ask, what is a virus? A virus is defined as a small infectious agent. It's submicroscopic, and what that means is it's below the detection of a light microscope. In fact, we need a special microscope to see these viruses. And the image you, you see on the right is influenza virus by electron microscopy. In contrast to bacteria, which have everything it needs to replicate, a virus does not, and so it's not a living cell. And in this picture of influenza virus, you can see its membrane, you can see nucleic acid inside, but one of the key components that the virus doesn't have are ribosomes and the virus needs us to complete replication. So it has to steal it and other things from somewhere else. This leads to a very important concept about viruses, and that is a virus is an obligate intracellular parasite. And this means that it's completely dependent on the living host cell for reproduction. An infectious viral particle is a virion, and it's composed of a limited number of structures that I'm gonna tell you about. First is the capsid. This is a protein coat that protects the nucleic acid genome. And it's important that nucleic acid genome is protected, otherwise the virus cannot replicate and reproduce. The capsid also allows the virus to attach to host cells. The envelope uh, is found only in some viruses, and it is made up of a lipid membrane, and it's derived from the host cell membrane. And the envelope functions as an extra protective layer. Last are these things sticking out of the envelope. These are the glycoproteins, and they're anchored in the envelope and are used by the virus to attach to a host cell. So you may be wondering, where did um, viruses start, where they came from? Uh, the origin of viruses is actually still very much debated, and there's two main theories uh, that people have discussed. One is that viruses were once genetic elements that then gained the ability to exit one cell and then enter another. And then two, viruses were transformed from a free-living organism into a parasite. Uh, there has been discussion that perhaps viruses are the precursor of life. So if you look at the image on the right, this is a tree. It's a phylogenetic tree showing you all of living things, bacteria, protozoa, animals, and fungi. And what you, can, what you can see in this image is that the viruses aren't part of the tree because the viruses aren't um, living things. However, viruses can infect all of these living things. Lastly, viruses are actually part of us. Each bacteria in our intestines can be a home for a virus. And in fact, a portion of our DNA comes from endogenous retroviruses. So viruses have evolved and will continue to evolve, and emerging viruses prove this point. Most of the recent new emerging viruses are zoonotic. This means that the virus is transmitted from animal to man, either directly or via a vector. Now the animal serves as a reservoir and wild animals or wildlife are increasingly implicated in zoonoses. For example, the bat that you see pictured um, have been recently found to be a reservoir host for many of the new emerging viruses that cause really severe disease. Uh, Ebola and SARS coronavirus are two of such examples. Now these new viral infections of humans evolve based on two concepts. The first is that these new viruses arise from mutations, reassortment, or recombinations. These new viruses then attempt to achieve successful replication within old and new hosts. Uh, and the second concept is about new environments. These develop that place closer human contact to these animal reservoirs. Ecology changes and an increase in world travel can actually create these new environments. Viral replication uh, is very much host cell dependent. And what I'm going to do through the next several slides is to take you through each step of a generalized viral life cycle. First, 
the virus attaches to a specific receptor on the host cell. It then enters the cell through endocytosis. Then the virus uncoats and releases their genome. What is pictured here is DNA going into the nucleus. If the virus has an RNA genome, that genome would replicate in the cytosol. The next step is that the virus uses the host cell machinery uh, to replicate its nucleic acid and to make all the necessary proteins. The nucleic acid and the structural components are then all assembled into new virions, and then the new virions are released from the host cell by budding or lysis. Envelope viruses release with a layer, the envelope, of the host cell membrane. This image shows the entire virus life cycle, um, all on the same slide, uh, so that you can review easier uh, later. There are two main things the virus needs to do to create a complete virion. It needs to copy its genome, and it needs to make protein. And you saw this in the viral life cycle that I just talked to you about. In order to copy its genome, it uses its starting nucleic acid, in this case, double-stranded RNA, it makes a template and then makes nucleic acid copies. In order to make protein, it uses its starting nucleic acid, makes messenger RNA, or mRNA, and then makes protein. Some of these proteins are to form the capsid, some are to help with copying the genome. The virion is then assembled by packaging the nucleic acid inside the capsid. Now I'm pointing this out because the path to make protein, that is nucleic acid to mRNA to protein, is the organizational scheme of what's called the Baltimore classification. So there are many viruses, and a simple way of organizing them is by their nucleic acid, DNA or RNA. And the Baltimore classification is a way that virologists use to organize viruses by their nucleic acid and by how it makes messenger RNA. So remember that in order to fully propagate, the virus must produce mRNA to then produce protein. This is one of the paths I just talked about in the previous slide. Messenger RNA is the central link um, for all seven groups in the Baltimore classification, as you can see in this image. So if you remember this as the central link, you can actually figure out the steps of how each virus, with its starting nucleic acid, makes protein and copies itself. The, this image also highlights the diversity of viral nucleic acid compared to nucleic acid for all other living things. All living things are only in group one. Here are some examples of viruses uh, in each one of the Baltimore classification groups. So organizing viruses by their genetic material actually has some clinical implications. Biologically, RNA and DNA viruses are different. So for example, during RNA synthesis, RNA viruses don't have proofreading mechanisms. So these viruses are prone to replication errors. DNA viruses are not because they do have proofreading mechanisms. Now mutations from repl replication errors can affect virulence, that's the capacity of the virus to cause disease, and these mutations can also enable a virus to become resistant to an antiviral medication. This concept is the basis of using multiple antiviral medications to treat HIV infections. RNA viruses must encode their own enzymes for RNA replication. DNA viruses can use host cell enzymes. So the use of a virus-encoded enzyme is an ideal target for an antiviral medication. And this is because you would see less side effects in your patient compared to using an antiviral medication that targets a host cell enzyme. In addition to organizing by nucleic acid, viruses can also be organized by their architecture, the shape and size, uh, the, and the shapes can be of three main types, as you can see uh, on the slide. The first one is called cylindrical, the second is called icosahedral, and the third is called complex. You can also organize viruses by whether they're um, enveloped or not enveloped. The viral nucleic acid in architecture actually allows us to group viruses into what we call families. So this is another way of organizing all the viruses and actually decreases the complexity of uh, having to learn all of these viruses. In addition, it allows you to see which viruses are related to each other. For example, you might hear in the clinics, you know, patients with herpes virus. 
So this is a family of eight viruses in the virus family called herpes viridae. Uh, and some of you might recognize some of these viruses, for example, varicella zoster virus, which causes chickenpox. And if you look through this table, you can see the name of the virus and the disease uh, that they cause. Because they are in the same family, they have very similar characteristics, even though they cause all of these different diseases. All herpes viruses are enveloped, icosahedral shape, and they all have double-stranded DNA nucleic acid. Now within a viral family, we can actually build phylogenetic trees, which show us which of these viruses are more closely related to each other. And so we show this to you um, on the slide. This has clinical implications because the same drugs could potentially be used for the same subfamily of herpes viruses, and the pathogenesis has similarities for viruses within each subfamily. Now what I've shown you here is only one example of a family, the herpes viridae. Next is a resource slide that depicts all the viral families of viruses that cause disease in humans. This is meant for you as a resource, so you can start to understand the relationships between viruses within a family and within their grouping by their nucleic acid. I don't want you to memorize this. In this course, we will be discussing the most important viruses that cause disease in humans. They are listed here, organized by their nucleic acid.